Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And a warm welcome to my reading of To Build a Fire by Jack London. I'm going to begin by asking Mike Potts, who's the press officer of the Kinder Mountain Rescue Team, to say a few words by way of introduction. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Adrian. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us for what is certain to be a wonderful 50 minutes listening to Adrian Reed. I have to say that being volunteered to be the warm-up act for a professional actor is possibly one of the more daunting taskings I've ever been given in Mountain Rescue, but never mind. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start by thanking Adrian and his friends most sincerely on behalf of the team for giving up their time to organise and undertake this event as a fundraiser for us. It's been a difficult year all round, I think we generally agree, and as a self-funded charity, it's been a very challenging year for the team with our usual fundraising activities curtailed. So events such as these are an absolute lifeline. Despite the constraints of the pandemic, as it has done for the last 50 years, the team has responded to a wide variety of calls for assistance this year. In fact, it's probably been one of our busiest with seemingly a stampede of walkers heading to the hills after the first lockdown. This year, we've been called out for everything from a vulnerable missing person who most definitely did not want our assistance and this led us a merry dance around Kraken Edge to the usual mountain related lower injuries, uh, more serious incidents such as a walker who fell several meters down rocks at Croden Tower on Kinder Scout, requiring a somewhat more complicated than usual rope rescue, right through to quite tragically attending on two separate occasions this week calls to assist two gentlemen on local low-level walking trails, both of whom uh, tragically died. And our thoughts are with the family and friends of those uh, gentlemen at this time. As you can see, it's not just in the hills and mountains that we operate. We regularly assist the police with the urban searches for missing people. We help the ambulance service to reach patients in difficult locations. And we assist the fire and rescue service with water and flood related incidents, such as Todbrook Reservoir, uh, having been deployed to Bakewell only a few weeks ago. And the team have previously been involved with the Lockerbie disaster, the search for April Jones in Wales and the flooding in Cumbria in 2015, if you uh, remember that. So with your generous generosity and support, we hope to continue doing what we do best for another 50 years at least. So thank you to everyone who's so generously donated to the team through this event. And now I shall hand back to Adrian for a somewhat more polished professional performance. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. That's very kind of you. Thanks for that nice introduction. So Jack London was born in 1876 and he died in 1916. He was an American novelist, journalist and a social activist. He was a pioneer of commercial fiction and American magazines. He became an international celebrity and he earned a very large fortune from his writing. He was also an innovator in the genre that would later become known as science fiction. In 1897, age 21, he joined the Klondike Gold Rush. He developed scurvy, lost four front teeth. For the rest of his life, constant gnawing pain affected his hip and leg muscles, and his face was stricken with frostbite. His struggles inspired To Build a Fire, which is arguably his best work. Two separate versions were published in 1902 and 1908. The latter is the better known one, and that is this one. One short word on the text, a chichaco is slang for a newcomer to the Yukon. This story is called To Build a Fire by Jack London. Day had broken cold and gray when the man turned aside from the main Yukon trail and climbed the high earth bank where a dim and little travel trail led eastward through the fat spruce timberland. It was a steep bank and he paused for breath at the top, excusing the act to himself by looking at his watch. 
It was nine o'clock. There was no sun nor a hint of sun, though there was not a cloud in the sky. It was a clear day, and yet there seemed an intangible pall over the face of things, a subtle gloom that made the day dark. This fact did not worry the man. It had been days since he'd seen the sun, and he knew that a few more days must pass before that cheerful orb due south would just peep above the skyline and dip immediately from view. The man flung a look back along the way he had come. The Yukon lay a mile wide and hidden under three feet of ice. On top of this ice were as many feet of snow. It was all pure white, rolling in gentle undulations where the ice jams of the freeze-up had formed. North and south, as far as his eye could see, it was unbroken white, save for a dark hairline that curved and twisted from around the spruce-covered island to the south, and that curved and twisted away into the north where it disappeared behind another spruce-covered island. This dark hairline was the trail, the main trail that led south, 500 miles to the Chilkoot Pass, Dai and Saltwater, and that led north 70 miles to Dawson, and still on to the north a 1,000 miles to Nulado and finally to St. Michael on Bering Sea, a thousand miles and a half thousand more. But all this, the mysterious hairline trail, the absence of sun from the sky, the tremendous cold, made no impression on the man. And it was not because he was long used to it. He was a newcomer in the land, a Chichaco, and this was his first winner. The trouble with him was that he was without imagination. He was quick and alert in the things of life, but only in the things and not in the significances. 50 degrees below zero meant 80 odd degrees of frost. Such fact impressed him as being cold and uncomfortable. And that was all. It did not lead him to meditate upon his frailty as a creature of temperature, and upon man's frailty in general, able only to live within certain narrow limits of heat and cold. And from there on, it did not lead him to the conjectural field of immortality and man's place in the universe. 50 degrees below zero stood for a, a bite of frost that hurt and must be guarded against by the use of mittens, ear flaps, warm moccasins, and thick socks. 50 degrees below zero was to him just precisely 50 degrees below zero. That there should be anything more to it than that was a thought that never entered his head. As he turned to go on, he spat speculatively. There was a sharp explosive crackle that startled him. He spat again and again in the air before it could fall to the snow, the spittle crackled. He knew that at 50 below, spittle crackled on the snow, but this spittle had crackled in the air. So undoubtedly, it was colder than 50 below. How much colder, he did not know. But the temperature did not matter. He was bound for the old claim on the left fork of Henderson Creek, where the boys were already. They'd come over across the divide from the Indian Creek country while he'd come the roundabout way to take a look at the possibilities of getting out logs in the spring from the islands at the Yukon. He'd been to camp by six o'clock, a bit after dark. It was true, but the boys would be there, a fire would be going, and a hot supper would be ready. As for lunch, he pressed his hand against the bundle under his jacket. It was wrapped up in a handkerchief and lying against the naked skin. It was the only way to keep the biscuits from freezing. He smiled agreeably to himself as he thought of those biscuits. 
sopped in bacon grease and each enclosing a generous slice of fried bacon. He plunged in among the big spruce trees. The trail was faint. A foot of snow had fallen since the last sledge had passed over, and he was glad he was traveling light. In fact, he, he carried nothing but the lunch wrapped in the handkerchief. He was surprised, however, at the cold. It certainly was cold, he concluded, as he rubbed his numb nose and cheekbones with his mittened hand. He was a warm whiskered man, but the hair on his face did not protect the high cheekbones and the nose that thrust itself aggressively into the frosty air. At the man's heels trotted a dog, a big native husky, a proper wolf dog, gray coated and without any visible or temperamental difference from its brother, the wild wolf. The animal was depressed by the tremendous cold. It knew that it was no time for traveling. Its instinct told it a truer tale than was told to the man by the man's judgment. In reality, it was colder than 60 below, than 70 below. It was 75 below zero. Now, the dog did not know anything about thermometers, but the dog had its instinct. It experienced a menacing apprehension that subdued it and made it slink along at the man's heels and question every movement of the man as if expecting him to go into camp or to seek shelter somewhere and build fire. The dog had learned fire and it wanted fire or else to burrow under the snow away from the air. The frozen moisture of its breathing had settled on its fur in a fine powder of frost. The man's red beard and mustache were likewise frosty, but more solidly, the deposit taking the form of ice and increasing with every warm, moist breath he exhaled. He'd been out before in two cold snaps. They'd not been so cold as this, he knew, but by the spirit thermometer at 60 mile, he knew they'd been registered at 50 below and at 55. He held on through the level stretch of woods for several miles, crossed a wide flat and dropped down a bank to the frozen bed of a small stream. This was Henderson Creek, and he knew he was 10 miles from the forks. He looked at his watch. It was 10 o'clock. He was making four miles an hour, and he calculated that he would arrive at the forks at half past 12. He decided to celebrate that event by eating his lunch there. The dog dropped in at his heels with a tail drooping discouragement as the man swung along the creek bed. The furrow of the old sledge trail was visible, but a dozen inches of snow covered the marks of the last runners. In a month, no man had come up or down that silent creek. The man held steadily on. He was not much given to thinking and he had nothing to think about save that he would eat lunch at the forks and that at six o'clock he would be in camp with the boys. There was nobody to talk to, and had there been, speech would have been impossible because of the ice muzzle on his mouth. So he continued monotonously on. Once in a while, the thought reiterated itself that it was very cold and that he'd never experienced such cold. As he walked along, he rubbed his cheekbones and nose with the back of his mittened hand. He did this automatically, but the instant he stopped, his cheekbones went numb, and the following instant, the end of his nose went numb. He was sure to frost his cheeks, he knew that, and experienced a pang of regret that he'd not devised a nose strap of the sort that Bud wore in cold snaps. Such a strap passed across the cheeks as well and saved them. But it didn't matter much, after all, what were frosted cheeks. A bit painful, that was all. They were never serious. 
Empty as the man's mind was, thoughts, he was keenly observant and noticed the changes in the creek, the curves and bends and timber jams, and always he sharply noted where he placed his feet. Once coming around a bend, he shied abruptly like a startled horse, curved away from the place where he'd been walking and retreated several paces back along the trail. The creek, he knew, was frozen clear to the bottom, but he knew also that there were springs that bubbled out from the hillsides and ran along under the snow and on top of the ice of the creek. He knew that the coldest snaps never froze these springs, and he knew likewise their danger. They were traps. They hid pools of water under the snow that might be three inches deep or three feet. Sometimes a skin of ice half an inch thick covered them and in turn was covered by the snow. Sometimes there were alternate layers of water and ice skin so that when one broke through, <clears throat> he kept on breaking through for a while, sometimes wetting himself to the waist. And that was why he'd shied in such a panic. He'd felt the give under his feet and he'd heard the crackle of a snow hidden ice skin. And to get his feet wet in such a temperature meant trouble and danger. At the very least, it meant delay, for he'd be forced to stop and build a fire and under its protection to bare his feet while he dried his socks and moccasins. He stood and studied the creek bed and its banks and decided that the flow of water came from the right. He reflected a while, rubbing his nose and cheeks, then skirted to the left stepping gingerly and testing the footing for each step. Once clear of the danger, he swung along at his four-mile gait. And in the course of the next two hours, he came upon several similar tracks, usually the snow above the hidden pools had a sunken, candid appearance that advertised the danger. Once again, however, he had a close call, and once, suspecting danger, he compelled the dog to go on in front. The dog did not want to go. It hung back until the man shoved it forward, and then it went quickly across the white, unbroken surface. Suddenly, it broke through, floundered to one side, and got away to firmer footing. It had wet its forefeet and legs. And almost immediately, the water that clung to it turned to ice. It made quick efforts to lick the ice off its legs, then dropped down in the snow and began to bite out the ice that had formed between the toes. This was a matter of instinct. To permit the ice to remain would mean sore feet. It did not know this. It merely obeyed the mysterious prompting that arose from the deep crypts of its being. But the man knew, having achieved a judgment on the subject, and he removed the mitten from his right hand and helped tear out the ice particles. He did not expose his fingers more than a minute and was astonished at the swift numbness that smote them. Yeah, it certainly was cold. He pulled on the mitten hastily and beat the hand savagely across his chest. At 12 o'clock, the day was at its brightest, yet the sun was too far south on its winter journey to clear the horizon. The bulge of the earth intervened between it and Henderson Creek, where the man walked under a clear sky at noon and cast no shadow. At half past 12, he arrived at the forks of the creek. He was pleased with the speed he'd made. If he kept it up, he would certainly be with the boys by six. He unbuttoned his jacket and shirt and drew forth his lunch. The action consumed no more than a quarter of a minute, yet in that brief moment, the numbness laid a hold of his exposed fingers. He did not put the mitten on, but instead struck the fingers a dozen sharp smashes against his leg. Then he sat down on a snow-covered log to eat. The sting that followed upon the striking of his fingers against his leg ceased so quickly that he was startled. He'd had no chance to take a bite of biscuit. He struck the fingers repeatedly and returned them to the mitten, bearing the other hand for the purpose of eating. He tried to take a mouthful, but the ice muzzle prevented. 
He'd forgotten to build a fire and thaw out. <laughs> he chuckled at his foolishness. And as he chuckled, he noted the numbness creeping into the exposed fingers. Also, he noted that the stinging which had first come to his toes when he sat down was already passing away. He wondered whether the toes were warm or not. He moved them inside the moccasins and decided that they were numb. He pulled the mitten on hurriedly and stood up. He was a bit frightened. He stamped up and down until the stinging returned into the feet. Yeah, it certainly was cold, was his thought. That man from Sulphur Creek had spoken the truth when telling how cold it sometimes got in, in the country. And he'd, he'd laughed at him at the time. Well, that showed one must not be too sure of things. There was no mistake about it. It was cold. He strode up and down, stamping his feet and threshing his arms until reassured by the returning warmth. Then he got out matches and proceeded to make a fire. From the undergrowth where high water of the previous spring had lodged a supply of seasoned twigs, he got his firewood. Working carefully from a small beginning, he soon had a roaring fire over which he thawed the ice from his face and in the protection of which he ate his biscuits. For the moment, the cold was outwitted. The dog took satisfaction in the fire stretching out close enough for warmth and far enough away to escape being singed. When the man had finished, he filled his pipe and took his comfortable time over a smoke. And then he pulled on his mittens, settled the ear flaps of his cap firmly about his ears and took the creek trail up the left fork. The dog was disappointed and yearned back toward the fire. This man did not know cold, but the dog knew. It had inherited the knowledge, and it knew that it was not good to walk abroad in such fearful cold. It was the time to lie snug in a hole in the snow and wait. On the other hand, there was no keen intimacy between the dog and the man. The one was the slave of the other and the only caresses it had ever received were the caresses of the whiplash and of harsh and menacing throat sounds that threatened the whiplash. So the dog made no effort to communicate its apprehension to the man. It was not concerned in the welfare of the man. It was for its own sake that it yearned back toward the fire. But the man whistled and spoke to it with the sound of whiplashes, and the dog swung in at the man's heels and followed after. The man's moist breath quickly powdered with white, his mustache, eyebrows, and lashes. There did not seem to be so many springs on the left fork of the Henderson, and for half an hour the man saw no signs of any. And then it happened. At a place where there were no signs, where the soft, unbroken snow seemed to advertise solidity beneath, the man broke through. Yeah, it was not deep. He wet himself halfway to the knees before he floundered out to the firm crust. He was angry and cursed his luck. He'd hoped to get into camp with the boys at six o'clock, and this would delay him an hour, for he would have to build a fire and dry out his footgear. This was imperative at that low temperature. He knew that much, and he turned aside to the bank, which he climbed. On top, tangled in the underbrush, about the trunks of several small spruce trees, was a high-water deposit of dry firewood, sticks and twigs principally, but also larger portions of seasoned branches and fine, dry, last year's grasses. He threw down several large pieces on top of the snow. This served for a foundation and prevented the young flame from drowning itself in the snow. It otherwise would melt. The flame he got by touching a match to a small shred of birch bark that he took from his pocket. 
This burned more readily than paper. Placing it on the foundation, he fed the young flame with wisps of dry grass and with the tiniest dry twigs. He worked slowly and carefully, keenly aware of his danger. Gradually, as the flame grew stronger, he increased the size of the twigs with which he fed it. He squatted in the snow, pulling the twigs out from their entanglement in the brush and feeding directly to the flame. He knew there must be no failure. When it's 75 below zero, a man must not fail in his first attempt to build a fire. Now that is, if his feet are wet. If his feet are dry and he fails, he can run along the trail for half a mile and restore his circulation. But the circulation of wet, freezing feet cannot be restored by running when it's 75 below. No matter how fast he runs, the wet feet will freeze the harder. All this the man knew. That old timer on Sulphur Creek had told him about it the previous fall, and now he was appreciating the advice. Already, all sensation had gone out of his feet. And to build the fire, he'd been forced to remove his mittens, and the fingers had quickly gone numb. His pace of four miles an hour had kept his heart pumping blood to the surface of his body and to all the extremities. But the instant he stopped, the action of the pump eased down. The blood was alive like the dog, and like the dog, it wanted to hide away and cover itself up from the fearful cold. So long as he walked four miles an hour, he pumped that blood to the surface. But now it ebbed away and sank down into his body. The extremities were the first to feel its absence. His wet feet froze the faster, and his exposed fingers numbed the faster, though they had not yet begun to freeze. Nose and cheeks were already freezing, while the skin of all his body chilled as it lost blood. But he was safe. Toes and nose and cheeks would be only touched by the frost, for the fire was beginning to burn with strength. He was feeding it with twigs the size of his finger. In another minute, he would be able to feed it with branches the size of his wrist, and then he could remove his wet foot gear, and while it dried, he could keep his naked feet warm by fire, rubbing them at first, of course, with snow. The fire was a success, and he was safe. <laughs> he remembered the advice of the old timer on Sulphur Creek and smiled. <laughs> Why, that old timer had been very serious in laying down the law that no man must travel alone in the Klondike after 50 below. Well, here he was. He'd had the accident. He was alone, and he'd saved himself. Yeah, those old timers were, were rather womanish, some of them, he thought. All a man had to do was to keep his head, and he was all right. Any man who was a man could travel alone. But it was surprising the rapidity with which his cheeks and nose were freezing. And he'd not thought his fingers could go lifeless in so short a time. Lifeless they were, for he could scarcely make them move together to grip a twig, and they seemed remote from his body and from him. When he touched a twig, he had to look and see whether or not he had hold of it. But there was the fire, snapping and crackling and promising life with every dancing flame. He started to untie his moccasins. They were coated with ice. The thick socks were like sheaths of iron halfway to the knees, and the moccasin strings were like rods of steel, all twisted and knotted. For a moment, he tugged with his numb fingers, and then realizing the folly of it, he drew his sheath knife. But before he could cut the strings, it happened. It was his own fault, or rather, his mistake. 
He should not have built the fire under the spruce tree. He should have built it in the open. But it had been easier to pull the twigs from the brush and drop them directly onto the fire. Now the tree under which he'd done this carried a weight of snow on its boughs. No wind had blown for weeks, and each bough was fully freighted. Each time he'd pulled a twig, it communicated a slight agitation to the tree, an agitation sufficient to bring about the disaster. High up in the tree, one bough capsized its load of snow. This fell on the boughs beneath, capsizing them. This process continued, spreading out and involving the whole tree. It grew like an avalanche, and it descended without warning upon the man and the fire, and the fire was blotted out. Where it had burned was a mantle of fresh and disordered snow. The man was shocked. It was as though he'd just heard his own sentence of death. For a moment, he sat and stared at the spot where the fire had been. And then he grew very calm. Perhaps the old timer on Sulphur Creek was right. If he'd only had a trail mate, he would have been in no danger now. The trail mate could have built the fire. Well, it was up to him to build the fire over again. And this second time, there must be no failure. Even if he succeeded, he would most likely lose some toes. His feet must be badly frozen by now, and there would be some time before the second fire was ready. Such were his thoughts, but he did not sit and think them. He was busy all the time they were passing through his mind. He made a new foundation for fire, this time in the open where no tree could blot it out. Next, he gathered dry grasses and tiny twigs from the high water flotsam. But he could not bring his fingers together to pull them out, but he was able to gather them by the handful. In this way, he got many rock twigs and bits of green that were undesirable, but it was the best he could do. He worked methodically, even collecting an armful of the larger branches to be used later when the fire gathered strength. And all the while, the dog sat and watched him, a wistfulness in its eyes, for it looked upon him as the fire provider. And this fire was slow in coming. When all was ready, the man reached in his pocket for a second piece of birch bark. He knew the bark was there, and though he could not feed it with his fingers, he could hear it rustling as he fumbled for it. Try as he would, he could not clutch hold of it. All the time in his consciousness was the knowledge that each instant his feet were freezing, and this put him in a panic. But he fought against it, and he kept calm. He pulled on his mittens with his teeth, and he threshed his arms back and forth, beating his hands with all his might against his sides. He did this sitting down, and he stood up to do it. And all the while, the dog sat in the snow. His wolf tail curled over its four feet, its sharp wolf ears pricked forward intently as it watched the man. And the man, as he beat and threshed with his arms and hands, felt a great surge of envy as he regarded the creature that was warm and secure in its natural covering. After a time, he was aware the first faraway signals of sensation in his beaten fingers. The faint tingling grew stronger until it evolved into a stinging ache that was excruciating, but which the man hailed with satisfaction. He stripped the mitten from his right hand and fetched forth the birch bark. The exposed fingers were quickly going numb again. Next, he brought out his bunch of matches, but the tremendous cold had already driven the life out of his fingers. In his effort to separate one match from the others, the whole bunch fell in the snow. He tried to pick it out of the snow, but failed. The dead fingers could neither touch nor clutch. He drove the thought of his freezing feet and nose and cheeks out of his mind, devoted his whole soul to the matches. He watched, using the sense of vision in place of that of touch. And when he saw his fingers on each side the bunch, he willed to close them. But the fingers did not obey. He pulled the mitten on the right hand and beat it fiercely against his knee. And then with both mitten hands, he scooped the bunch of matches, along with much snow, into his lap. 
yet he was no better off. After some manipulation, he managed to get the bunch between the heels of his mittened hands. In this fashion, he carried it to his mouth. The ice crackled and snapped when by a violent effort, he opened his mouth. He drew the lower jaw in, curled the upper lip out of the way and scraped the bunch with his upper teeth in order to separate a match. He succeeded in getting one, which he dropped on his lap, but he could not pick it up. Then he devised a way. He picked it up in his teeth and scratched it on his leg. 20 times he scratched before he succeeded in lighting. As it flamed, he held it with his teeth to the birch bark, but the burning brimstone went up his nostrils, causing him to cough. The match fell into the snow and went out. The old timer on Sulphur Creek was right. He thought in the moment of despair that ensued. After 50 below, a man should travel with heart. He beat his hands, but failed in exciting any sensation. And suddenly he bared both hands, removing the mittens with his teeth. He caught the whole bunch between the heels of his hands. His arm muscles not being frozen enabled him to press the hand heels tightly against the matches. And then he scratched the bunch along his leg. It flared into flame. 70 sulfur matches at once. There was no wind to blow them out. He kept his head to one side to escape the strangling fumes and held the blazing bunch to the birch bark. And as he held it, he became aware of sensation in his hand because his flesh was burning. He could smell it. Deep down below the surface, he could feel it. The sensation developed into pain that grew acute. And still he endured it, holding the flame of the matches clumsily to the bark that would not light readily because his own burning hands were in the way, absorbing most of the flame. At last, when he could endure no more, he jerked his hands apart. Blazing matches fell sizzling into the snow, but the birch bark was alight. He began laying dry grasses and the tiniest twigs on the flame. He could not pick and choose, for he had to lift the fuel between the heels of his hands. Small pieces of rotten wood and green moss clung to the twigs, and he bit them off as well as he could with his teeth. He cherished the flame carefully and awkwardly. It meant life, and it must not perish. The withdrawal of blood from the surface of his body now made him to begin to shiver, and he grew more awkward. A large piece of green moss fell squarely on the little fire. He tried to poke it out with his fingers, but his shivering frame made him poke too far, and he disrupted the nucleus of the little fire. The burning grasses and tiny twigs separating and, and scattering, and he, and he tried to poke them together again, but in spite of the tenseness of the effort, his shivering got away with him and the twigs were hopelessly scattered and each twig gushed a puff of smoke and went out. The fire provider had failed. As he looked apathetically about him, his eyes chanced on the dog, sitting across the ruins of the fire from him in the snow, making restless, hunching movements, slightly lifting one forefoot and then the other, shifting its weight back and forth on them with wistful eagerness. And the sight of the dog put a wild idea in his head. He remembered the tale of the man caught in a blizzard who killed a steer and crawled inside the carcass and so was saved. He would kill the dog and bury his hands in the warm body until the numbness went out of it. And then he could build another fire. He spoke to the dog, calling it to him. 
but in his voice was a strange note of fear that frightened the animal, who'd never known the man to speak in such way before. Something was the matter, and it's in danger. Somewhere, somehow, in its brain arose an apprehension of the man. him unrelated to the earth. His standing position in itself drove the suspicion from the dog's mind, and when he spoke with the sound of whip lashes in his voice, the dog came to him. But as it came within reaching distance, the man lost his control. His arms flashed out to the dog, and he experienced genuine surprise when he discovered that his hands could not clutch, that there was neither bend nor feeling in the fingers. He'd forgotten for the moment that they were frozen and that they were freezing more and more. And all this happened quickly and before the animal could get away, he encircled its body with his arms, sat down in the snow and held the dog while it snarled and whined and struggled. But it was all he could do hold its body encircled in his arms, sit there. He realized that he could not kill the dog because there was no way to do it. With his helpless hands, he could neither draw nor hold his sheath knife nor throttle the animal. He released it and it plunged wildly away with tail between its legs, still snarling and halted 40 feet away, surveying him curiously with ears pricked forward. The man looked down at his hands in order to locate them and found them hanging on the ends of his arms. It struck him as curious that he should have to use his eyes in order to find out where his hands were. He began threshing his arms back and forth, beating the mittened hands against his sides. He did this for five minutes, violently, and his heart pumped enough blood up to the surface to put a stop to his shivering. But no sensation was aroused in the hands. They hung like weights on the ends of his arms. A fear of death. Dull and oppressive came on him. And he realized that it was no longer a matter of freezing his fingers and toes, or of losing his hands and feet, but that it was a matter of life and death with the chances against him. And this threw him into a panic, and he turned and he ran up the creek bed along the old dim trail. The dog joined in behind and kept up with him. He ran blindly, without intention, in fear such as he'd never known in his life. Slowly, as he plowed and floundered through the snow, he began to see things again. The banks of the creek, the old timber jams, the leafless aspirins and the sky. And the running made him feel better. Maybe, maybe if he ran on, his, his feet would thaw out. And anyway, if he ran far enough, he, he would reach camp and the boys. Without doubt, he'd lose some fingers, and toes, and some of his face, but the boys would take care of him and save the rest of him when he got there. And at the same time, there was another thought in his mind that said he would never get to the camp and the boys, that it was too many miles away, that the freezing had too great a start on him, and that he would soon be stiff and dead. And this thought he kept in the background and refused to consider. Sometimes it pushed itself forward and demanded to be heard, but he thrust it back and strove to think of other things. It struck him as curious that he could run at all on feet so frozen that he could not feel them when they struck the earth and took the weight of his body. He seemed to himself to skim along above the surface, 
and to have no connection with the earth. Somewhere he'd once seen a, a winged Mercury and he wondered if Mercury felt as he felt when skimming over the earth. His theory of running until he reached camp and the boys had one flaw in it. He lacked the endurance. Several times he stumbled. And finally, he tottered, crumpled up, and fell. When he tried to rise, he failed. He must sit and rest, he decided, and next time he'd merely walk and keep on going. As he sat and regained his breath, he noted that he was feeling quite warm and comfortable. He was not shivering. And it even seemed that a warm glow had come to his chest and trunk. And yet when he touched his nose or cheeks, there was no sensation. Running would not thaw them out, and nor would it thaw out his hands and feet. And then the thought came to him that the frozen portions of his body must be extending. He tried to keep this thought down, to forget it, to think of something else. He was aware of the panicky feeling that it caused, and he was afraid of the panic. But the thought asserted itself and persisted until it produced a vision of his body totally frozen. And this was too much, and he made another wild run along the trail. Once he slowed down to a walk, but the thought of the freezing extending itself made him run again. And all the time the dog ran with him at his heels. When he fell down a second time, it curled its tail over its four feet and sat in front of him, facing him curiously eager and intent. The warmth and security of the animal angered, and he cursed it till it flattened down its ears, appeasing him. And this time the shivering came more quickly upon the man. He was losing his battle with the frost. It was creeping into his body from all sides. The thought of it drove him on. But he ran no more than a hundred feet when he staggered and pitched headlong. And that was his last panic. When he'd recovered his breath and control, he sat up and entertained in his mind the conception of meeting death with dignity. His idea was that he'd been making a fool of himself, running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Such was the simile that occurred to him. Well, he was bound to freeze anyway. And he might as well take it decently. And with this newfound peace of mind came the first glimmerings of drowsiness. A good idea, he thought. To sleep after death. It was like taking an anesthetic. Freezing was not so bad as people thought. There were lots worse ways to die. He pictured the boys finding his body next day. And suddenly he found himself with them, coming along the trail and looking for himself. And still with them, he came around a turn in the trail and found himself lying in the snow. He did not belong with himself anymore, for even then he was out of himself, standing with the boys and looking at himself in the snow. It certainly was cold, was his thought. When he got back to the States, he could tell the folks what real cold was. And he drifted on from this to a a vision of the old timer on Sulphur Creek. He could see him quite clearly, warm and comfortable and smoking a pipe. <laughs> you were right, old horse, 
You were right, the man mumbled to the old timer. And then the man drowsed off into what seemed to him the most comfortable sleep he'd ever known. The dog sat facing him, waiting. The brief day drew to a close in a slow twilight. There were no signs of a fire to be made. Besides, never in the dog's experience had it known a man to sit like that in the snow and make no fire. As the twilight drew on, its yearning for the fire mastered it, and with a great lifting and shifting of four feet, it whined softly and then flattened its ears down in anticipation of being chidden by the man. But the man remained silent. And later, the dog whined loudly. And still later, it crept close to the man and caught the scent of death. And this made the animal bristle and back away. A little longer, it delayed. Howling under the stars that leaped and danced and shone brightly in the cold sky. And then it turned and trotted up the trail in the direction of the camp it knew. Where were the other food providers? And fire providers. 